All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, hanging out there for a few minutes as we got everything set up this morning. Uh, my name is Greg Jones. I'm the editor of Engine Builder Magazine, and I'm coming to you live from the Babcock's studio garage. And uh, we've got a very exciting day today. Uh, we have three amazing guests. All right, can people hear me now on, on Zoom? All right, I apologize. Uh, as I was saying, we've got three great guests today. Um, joining us from EFI University is Ben Strader. Ben's an expert in EFI uh, systems and engine tuning. And we've got two folks from Total Seal Piston Rings, Lake Speed Jr. and Keith Jones. Both these guys have decades of experience in the industry and know uh, pretty much everything there is to know about engines. So guys, uh, thanks for joining us today and welcome. Quite happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, just a couple of housekeeping uh, things for you guys. For the folks uh, on Zoom, we're going to ask that you guys stay muted so that we can hear our presenters and, uh, that, and that everyone can, uh, can hear there. And then um, if you have a question, we, we want plenty of audience participation. So please make sure that uh, you guys put those questions in the chat on Zoom. And if you have something that's a little bit more technical, something a little bit you know, more complicated than uh, you can just type out, please feel free to um, do the raise your hand feature on Zoom and we can, uh, we'll call on you guys to, to speak and ask your question there. We're also going live on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. So for anyone who's on those platforms, please just put your, your comments or questions uh, in the comments section. And uh, we will get to you guys when we when we can, and, and we'll call on, on those questions. And uh, so, without further ado, we'll, we'll just kind of jump into things here. Um, and I'll kind of kick off the first question for Ben, Keith, and Blake. Um, now, if you guys take a look back a number of years ago, you know pistons have changed quite. A, excuse me, piston rings have changed quite a bit. Um, you know they're a lot different than they are today. Uh, they're made of different materials, and therefore they have different porosity as it relates to oil retention uh, versus today's rings. So guys, can you talk a little bit about how those elements of piston rings today factor into cylinder bore finishes? We, we, we no had worries, no our, 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 our tech tech tune up on us there, you know. Are we better now? <laughs> Very much so. Now, <laughs> uh, yeah, everything's everything's changed. Everything is is evolved. The 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 foundation of the engine, we'll call it the engine block. That's that's the first thing. That's the thing that's really dramatically changed. Uh, back in the old days. You know, an engine block, small block Chevy, big block Chevy, uh, you would have the word, you, know, you hear the word a high nickel block, a race mm -hmm. block. And, you know, using Brunel numbers, which we typically measure cylinders in, uh, production block might be 150, 160 Brunel. So uh, a very loose kind of a flake gray iron, uh, very porous material on its own. Uh, just, just the material would hold oil. We've all seen cast iron uh, that's been stained or a cast iron pan or pot that, you know, it's been oiled so many times it's changed color and it's actually holding that oil. Uh, the blocks were kind of that way. Uh, they, were, they were fairly oleophilic. So honing, not to say that it wasn't as critical as it is today, but it was a very soft block. So the block itself kind of liked to hold oil. It was relatively easy to hone and we had big honking rings, you know, kind of the size of something <laughs> like this, that if it's going to go in there, guess what? It's, you know, what is that? A 40 pound oil ring? I mean, it, it's going to seat up. It's, you know, whether you screw the cylinder finish up, get it right, get it wrong, the ring's going to kind of go in and, and fix things. Well, that's not the world we deal with today. The blocks today range from in the high 100s into excess of 500 extremely hard cylinders that just by the nature of the material don't want to hold oil. In actuality, they actually want to reject oil. They don't want to hold that oil. And the whole purpose of the whole point of that cylinder finish is to get a bore straight, to get it round, good geometry, proper size. But as or more importantly, is to get that finish, to make that cylinder 
hold that oil, retain that oil, because as Lake has said in coin so many times, oil is the gasket. It is the seal. It is what seals that ring to the wall. The ring and the piston really don't ride on the cylinder wall. They ride on the oil that's on the cylinder wall. And our challenge today is to get that oil retention in that block, in that wall that we need for today's thinner, harder rings. Again, going back to the older days, we were dealing with generally plain cast iron type rings, little to no coating, maybe a molybdenum coating, which again, Molly's very porous, mm -hmm. holds oil like a sponge. Uh, it's, it's literally up to about 40% porosity. Where we move into today's rings, where we're dealing with hard coatings, PVDs or gas nitrided rings that don't have a coating, but very, very hard surfaces that have very little ability to hold oil, maybe three, 4% porosity. We have to make the cylinder do the oil trapping. Something has to hold the oil. If it's not gonna be the cylinder and it's not gonna be the ring, then we're, you know, we're gonna run into trouble because it's gonna be you know, metal on metal. Uh, and that's going to be an issue. So the biggest thing that's changed is really the blocks. The blocks are the significant thing. The ring is also changed, but the big one that we deal with every day is the hardness of that cylinder and how much harder it is to get those numbers. Again, going back to the numbers, which we've mentioned in the past, and we'll expand on more. You know, we, we talk about measured surface numbers and those numbers really don't change a lot. They're a, a relatively tight window. They might swing a little this way for a twin turbo pro mod car. They might swing a little this way for an NHRA pro stock car, or NASCAR engine, but that basic window is about the same. The, the challenge is how do I get that on a gray iron block that's 150, 160 Brunel versus a Durabar cylinder that may be 350 Brunel. I still want the same numbers at the end of the day, but how I achieve them is a completely different process. Oh yeah, I mean, think about yeah. I me, mean, I mean, just the, the year or so that I've been here, it's, you hear it all the time. This is the most common thing. And you can have, you know, the same machine with the same abrasives, the same coolant, the same process, the same everything, and run four different blocks through it yeah. and get four different surface finishes. And, and that's the real challenge, especially getting to compacted graphite. Oh. If, I mean, if you don't have diamonds, just forget about it. And you're, you're never going to get the numbers and you're going to struggle with ring seal. Because like you know, Keith said, oil is the gasket. And that surface finish is all about achieving enough oil where it's supposed to be when it's supposed to be there so that you can get that seal. So without it, it's bad things are going to happen. So like, I think there's a good point to make there in that um, not only does it take for, for the same, you know, a machine setup, it takes a different procedure between blocks. But oftentimes if you've got a block where say it's been torn up and you put a sleeve or two in it, you're going to have to figure out what it wants in the cylinders that have sleeves versus the ones that don't. It's not going to be one set it and forget it type operation. Oh, exactly. Yeah, that, I mean, some people have even said it, within certain blocks, there can be a variance from hole to hole. Um, yeah. Just based on, to me, it's a cast piece. If anybody's ever gone to a foundry, uh, that's not like blending oil in a lab. <laughs> You've got a gram scale and you're measuring out stuff by that. It's like, okay, here's a fire, throw some stuff in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pour it. Pour it. it it's going it, to, there's going to be some, some variances there, but you mean your point exactly. If you've got a block that you sleeved, those sleeves are going to behave differently mm -hmm. than the holes that are not sleeved. And, and not just in texture and finish, but also in what it takes to get them straight and round. You know, they tend to move around a lot more than a non sleeve cylinder will. So that, that those loads and speeds and feeds are going to be different. It's not a set it and forget it, walk away kind of deal. And obviously, we were talking about this to kick off this whole thing. But one of the reasons that this is the first topic is because this is the conversation every single day on the phone here. It, it, you, a day does not go by. An hour does not go by. I was walking around the parking lot yesterday for 20 minutes talking to a guy about this thing. It's like, hey, here's what you need yeah. to do. You, you're try, you got a 1,500 horsepower marine engine, and you're trying to get 1,000 hours on it. Well, RVK just became your favorite term. Because without that, there's no chance you're ever going to get there. And if you we start talking about RVK, if you don't have one of these, forget about it. 
You're, right, right. You, and you, you have to have the data. See, and I, Lake, I was. <laughs> that was before. <laughs> that was okay. I was like, oh, he's out in the parking lot. Uh, he must be getting yelled at. <laughs> um, no, no, guys, those are all points about uh, you know the rings today and the different materials of blocks and sleeves that ender builders are constantly dealing with. Um, and, and you just brought up the profilometer and, and the different you know devices that guys need to use to measure and, and get the data. Can you just elaborate on what the importance of a profilometer really is to these guys? The only way to get I me, mean, think about it. Who doesn't have one of these in the shop? I mean, it, I mean, there, I mean there's a micrometer somewhere within yeah. arm's reach of this place. You, you wouldn't even think about measuring a crankshaft, right? right without a micrometer. So literally this is the most important thing in the short block. I mean, not say that balancing and clearances and things aren't important, but as Keith alluded to, the change in block material and what we're doing, the change in fuels. That's another thing I think we probably, a variable we really didn't yeah. talk about right. is, okay, old school days, uh, we had pump gas and race gas. We had gas, alcohol, nitro. Right. You didn't have all these weird exotic fuels that have every different stoichiometric yeah. ratio that yeah. you can imagine. Oxygenated, not oxygenated, E5, right. E15, you've got a plethora of these days. And you're like, so, okay, what does fuel have to do with surface finish? All right. Back to stoichiometric ratio. We all know that methanol, for example, mm -hmm. you run essentially twice as much methanol as you do gasoline. Okay, if I'm running twice the amount of fuel into that cylinder, what's it trying to do? It's trying to wash away the oil. It's trying to displace the oil. Okay, if oil is the gasket, if I've got this you know, avalanche, you know, wa waterfall of fuel coming in there, I have to create more valley to hold that oil. Yes, you can put a higher viscosity oil in, but as an oil guy, I can tell you that that's only gonna do so much of the battle. Yeah. And yeah. so higher viscosity, good thing, more surface finish, more RVK to let the, give the oil a place to bite into. I that think there's, more, there's way more advantage to getting the surface finish right to hold the oil properly than by trying to just band-aid it with a thicker oil that's harder to wash off. What what you have to give away for the other oil isn't worth the short-term fix. No, plus it's not going to rip me. If you give the oil a place to bite into, then it's really going to live longer. It's going to stay there. It's going to seal up better. Um, it, in the end goal is that's going to work better, like you said, than just going to straight 70 weight and you're you know, nitro engine or, or your alcohol fueled engine, it, there's, you don't really need that. And I think that's the other variable. If it, okay, we've got on the street, okay, 15 years ago, we didn't have ethanol in the fuel. Now 10% of pump gas is pretty much ethanol. We've got E85, you've got all these other uh, concoctions out yep. there now. That's the other X variable in here. Yes, blocks have changed. Yes, ring materials have changed. I mean, really for the better, right? A steel ring is way better. PVD coating is way better. But the downside is they don't hold oil. So you got to adjust for it. Now you got these fuels that are carrying more oxygen. So you, the more oxygen you have in the fuel, what do you got to do, Ben? And have to richen it up, buddy. Right. So now more fuel wash. So it's all these things coming together, which is why it's the everyday conversation because it's the old school small block build it the way you used to do it and run it isn't working as well as it used to. And these are the reasons why, and back to, to Greg to answer your question in a really long ways, yes, this and this go hand in hand. If you use this to measure something, this is the only way to measure your surface finish of your cylinder. Your fingernail and your eyeball are not gonna get it done. The most sophisticated honing machines in the world you're still i mean you spend six figures on you know a wonderful piece of honing equipment it's still only as good as the guy standing in front of that machine it can make a beautiful hole get it straight get it round 
do it quickly, do it automatically, mm -hmm. walk away from it, let it go. But it still only knows the surface finish that you tell it to do. The procedure that you develop to get that desired finish. As Lake said, I, I can tell you how many customers have made the change <laughs> simply from going from a gasoline-based engine to an E85 based engine in their street turbo car. And all of a sudden they've got issues. They've got premature bore wear, it's smoking, it's doing these things. They simply change the fuel. And what they didn't accommodate for when they built the engine initially is that change. So we need to set that surface finish knowing it's going to end up at E85. We've got to get the right amount of oil retention. We've got to be able to create that seal so that when we introduce that excessive amount of fuel or extra fuel, we prepared the engine for that. We have to kind of have, we'll say, know what our end game is going to be so that we can build that foundation and have it ready for everything that you're going to throw at it. Then we go also into specific gravity. Oh yeah. Specific gravity of the fuel. That affects where it will displace, where it will go, things it will do that this fuel may not do versus what this fuel will do. And Lake had mentioned RBK, that valley depth. As, as time goes on, keep in mind, guys, we're learning every day just like you are and what we're trying to, you know, ex, you know take that information and pass on to you. And what we're finding with these highly fueled engines, whether it be, you know, monstrous diesels, nitro alcohol, is that valley depth, you know, we have some ideas of where they need to be from, you know, testing that we've done, feedback from our customers, but I'll, I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say, you almost can't get it too high. I mean, you can, but <laughs> there's a trade-off. There, there's a trade-off. But the more and more we learn about these highly fueled engines, getting that valley depth high and maybe even a little higher than what you think almost never backfires. It pays the dividend in longevity, improved ring seal, no black death, no scuffing. We've got to keep those parts lubricated. And in that high volume fuel engine, it is critical. And the you, I was written up on the board, but I'm pretty sure you can't see it. And I think it's backwards anyway. But the, the point being is that, you know, we all, again, used to measuring things in thousands, tens of thousands. So this device measures in micro inches. But so for, for some perspective, because I know there were some sheets been around for a long time in terms of honing procedures and how you plateau finish. Oh, you know, you take this many thousands and you go this many thousands and all that. Just hear me out for a second. 100 micro inches is equal to a tenth of a thousandth. One tenth. 100 micro inches. Yep. A good deep valley, about what, 150 micro inches? That'd, that'd be a really deep one. Yeah. So if you think about a tenth each side, right, a surface, yeah. that's two tenths yeah. on the gauge. If you go a half a thou with your finishing stone, guess what happened to your base finish? Oh, out the window. It's that sensitive. And Greg, that's really the reason why this is incredibly uh, important. Um, I think John, the producer is listening. And if he is, uh, John, can you pull up the, uh, the, the, the photos that begin with the base finish? This is somebody, um, actually Steph at race, uh, Ace Racing Engines sent me these pictures the other day. We've been going back and forth, yep. helping him trying to tune in his finish to, you know, these very specific questions. And he actually sent me back these photos, uh, that were actually perfect where it showed this is what he was doing. Uh, I think it was a, a 180, I think he used uh, grit, because that's the whole thing. If you don't have enough grit to begin with, you're, you can't add valley with your finishing stones. It's never going to make it bigger. It's only going to make it smaller. Right. So the, the finishing stones are kind of like wet sanding your paint job, right? You're never going to get deeper right. by doing that. No, exactly. Um, so I think he began with like a 180 grip and he got it with a close to size. Then he finished to size with, I believe, either a 220 or a 280. Then he had a 600 to finish. And what he was doing was he was taking the profilometer and checking 
at each stage Every in step. between. So knowing that, hey, I'm going for a 50 RVK for this application. Pump gas, street motor, air-cooled, turbo. All right, I need 50. Yeah. All right, so I've got to be over 50 by a pretty good number yeah. on my base finish. Otherwise, there's no chance. Then the mid-abrasive to go to size was still lining up somewhere around high 60s, mid 60s, come in with a 600, that knocked it down to about 15. Boom, he was right where he's supposed to be, a really nice finish. The only way he was able to get there, and he wasn't the only one that's been doing this recently since they got this tool, is they can watch in between, then you can dial in your process because we can't tell you what to do. Every block reacts different. Yeah, every home's different. The, the race is the coolant, the coolant oh versus oil. Every, everything affects it. As Lake said, don't wait to the end with this thing. You want to use it all the way along the line. If you're using the 170 stone, and the most common thing that I deal with taking these calls every day is most guys, we're, we're stuck in program teachings that we've got from you know our father, our father's father, our friend's dad, whoever mm -hmm. it was that passed it down to us. And the, the most common thing is I hear all the time, yeah, I stopped five thousandths to size. Then I started working my way down. Well, guys, you know, maybe five tenths, not five thousandths. These are micro inches. They stop way too far away from finish size with what I'll call the rough stone and start working their way back to that finish. Well, you wiped out everything that started. As, as Lake said, you know, thinking about that too, we've got to create you know, if, if this is the cylinder wall, we've got to create that deep tube. We've got to create that valley for the oil retention. So if I'm the only, you know, I work my way down and I've only got this little bit, well, there's no valley left. I've already wiped it out. Now I come in and I plateau on top of it. There's, there's nothing. Never ever be afraid of using a rough stone to lay that valley and to get that big deep cut because as I plateau, I'm making that number smaller and smaller. So I've got to leave enough of that so that when I'm at size and I've got that really nice plateaued surface, I've left that valley. As I started to say, the biggest thing I deal with is people using too many steps, too fine of a stone. Don't be afraid to come in with that 170, 180, lay that base in, get it within just darn near to size, then come in and start plateauing but use that profilometer along the way. Don't wait till you're at the end going, I've got nothing more to take out. Hit it every step, use that rougher stone, bring it within a couple of tenths, check it. And at that point in time, the only number that I'm really concerned with is that RVK. I really don't care what the RPK or the RK is at that point in time. I gotta know that I've got a lot of RVK in it. Maybe if I'm shooting for a 50, maybe 70, 80, 100, I can always make that number smaller. I can't make it bigger. So if that number is there and you start plateauing, each couple strokes come back in, check it, and you'll watch the numbers come down. Don't wait till you're done to check the job. Right. I think what Ed Keebler from Rottler said is that the RVK is going to be determined by your, your roughing stone. Your RPK is going to be determined by your finishing, finishing stone. stone. Then the RK is going to be kind of what the yeah, average well, or rough it out is what it's going to be. Some people like to, you know, multi-step hone. As Lake said, you can throw it, I'll call it a mid stone in there. It just kind of speeds up the plateauing process. You can effectively, if you wanted to go from a 170 to a 500, you can do that. Mm -hmm. It will keep plateauing it down. It just might take more strokes to ultimately get there. So if you want to go 170 and then say 280, a couple of strokes in the middle, then your 500 or whatever your finishing stone is, that might speed the process up just a little bit, but don't go too far. Remember, especially with diamonds, they cut very, very quickly. I've seen finishes change in one stroke like that. So yeah. you really want to be careful, watch your speed, speeds, pressures, yep. very important uh, and check it, check it, check it. Don't wait till you're done. And the cool thing is that there are tools now because on the old days, right? It was kind of tricky to get this thing, detach it, and be able to put that into the bore while it's in the home. We get that. Fortunately, uh, 
Brad and the guys at QMP, smart. They made a holder so it goes on it. Then it can go in the, in the bore and you can locate it, adjust it to size. If you have one of these, you probably need one of these, but it just makes life easier to be able to do what we're recommending you do. But it does work. I mean, you know, I've not talked to anybody that had questions about how do I get that finish, hit, hit those numbers that if they got one of those and they got the holder to go with it and they checked in between, it didn't take them but about a day honing to figure it out. Now, every block you go through different things, that's gonna change, but you can learn your process for those different materials. Then you can go back and you know where, where to go. Earlier, you had mentioned compacted graphite and compacted graphite is one of the really tricky ones. Compacted graphite, CG, as some mm -hmm. people call it, it's, it's typically very gummy, very tacky. Uh, it doesn't like to let the stone clean. Keeping that clean, fresh abrasive on the bore is super critical. And one of the things with a, a super abrasive like a diamond is they really don't break down. Vitrified, the old vitrified stones, they break down. They wear out. They're constantly self-cleaning, keeping fresh, clean abrasive on that cylinder. Well, with today's automated machines, you know, I, I punch that in until I want to take five thou out of the block. Well, it's all got to come out of the block. It can't come off the stone. If three comes out of the block and two off the stone, well, I didn't get the whole size that I wanted. So the abrasives really don't break down. Uh, so you have to constantly you know, use the eyes, watch the color of that cylinder. It should always be silvery, bright, shiny, sparkly. If it starts to go dark, dull, black, chrome, really dark gray, it's trying to burnish the cylinder. And that's telling you your abrasive is loading up. It's not cleaning. So don't be afraid to clean those abrasives. Watch the color of that cylinder. It should always be bright, light, very, I'll call it white. Glitter, yeah. yeah, it should be that brilliant, sparkly color. Uh, and especially with compacted graphite, because it is so gummy, it has a tendency to really want to load up abrasives really fast. Uh, again, I've seen compacted graphite go from a beautiful finish to black as the pitch of night in two strokes. Burnish that cylinder like you can't believe because it would not clean the stone, would not clean itself. So hmm. pay attention to, you know, not only are we looking at the measured numbers, pay attention to the color, the look of the cylinder. Uh, it says a lot. Yeah. Well, well guys, those are all super great points. Um, and I just want to, again, welcome some people who might have been joining us late. Um, you know, we're, we're live broadcasting this to Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. So if you guys have questions, please make sure you put them in the chat or in the comments, and uh, we'll make sure to get to them. Um, Lake and Keith, you guys are both just talking about a lot about data and measurements and the stuff that you're going to learn through use of a profilometer. But can you talk about what you need to do to make sure that you're documenting that data and that you're you know, retaining it build to build and when an engine comes in versus leaving the shop? Can you talk a little bit about the importance of that? They, the, I like to call it the build book. And in, in my day, I'm a little bit older, uh, I kept a, a, a notebook. Everything I built, every dimension, every measurement, bore finishes before and after. You always want to look at the number, what it went into the engine with, how it came out of the engine, keeping that data. Now, in today's world, with you know a wonderful tool like the profilometer, which has access to be plugged into your computer, or we can download the information to SD card. SD card. You know, we can track that data via your computer. There's software, you load it, keep that data, store that data. But having that data and being able to look at that data, again, it's so important, what I'll call pre and post, because it tells us so much about how the engine's running, how the engine's working. We know what we expect for normal bore wear. And you keeping that data and looking at it, I'll call it forensically when the mm -hmm. engine comes apart, it should take you every bit as long to take it apart as you put it together if you're really looking at everything. And kind of like you know, the dog whisper, it's talking if you're listening. Oh, yeah. It's telling you things about overfueled, overheated. It's telling you a story if you're paying attention. So looking at those finish numbers pre and post are, are, are very informative. It will tell you a lot about what's happening with your engine. Uh, I think Ben, I, I would say... Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Lake. Yeah, I was going to say, I think Ben has a term for this. <laughs> uh, well, I call it reverse blueprinting, right? So Keith's right. It probably takes us, when we have an engine that, uh, that, that has been run and comes apart, 
it probably takes us between 30 and 40 hours um, to measure and document. So I, I keep like a folder like this for every one of the engines that we do. And it's filled with tons of data. So we have a, a basic package where we keep about between 15 and 16 pages of notes on each engine, but not just each engine, each engine iteration. So I always talk a lot about how we mainly do research and development and, and engine development is different than engine building, right? So guys build engines, they go out the door, they race for however long, you know, the season, whatever, they come back and they look at what broke or what failed and they change those to new parts and go back out. But I think the difference is what we do a lot of is we will uh, measure and document and, and set up the engine, then we'll run it on the dyno, and then literally the next day take it back apart and remeasure everything. Um, and then every time we do that, it gets measured. So then, like Keith said, when it goes out in the field, when it comes back, if the engine's been running really good, for example, like last year we had our, our small block Ford that was out there running and you know ran really well, set some records, was reliable. So when we got that back, what I wanted to know is what did the engine end up like? Because that's where it's happy, right? So now what I do is I go, well, it came back in, still sealed up, still makes pan vacuum, still runs good. So what are the, you know, RPK, R, RVK, and, and RK values? Because now I'm going to target those for my next home and basically try to shorten the time it's going to take to, you know, break in the engine or whatever and get it back to where it's happy. So, um, you know, the last couple of years, we've really focused on the documentation side a lot more, um, not just in our cylinder finish, but on everything else, you know, and that's one of the areas that has really been sort of, I guess, enlightening where, you know, there's knowing and there's thinking, right? We always think we, got, I need this or I need that. And I think I know what to do, but the engine turns around and tells you what it actually wants, but you're only going to be able to talk to the engine and interpret what it's saying if you're able to compare real data, right? So, for us, uh, like I said, we, we literally, when an engine comes back from the race car, um, I probably spend between 30 and 40 hours uh, meticulously measuring and, and documenting that stuff so that we can recreate it later. Yeah, that's fantastic, fantastic stuff, stuff, guys. Thank you. Uh, we got a bunch of questions coming in now, so I'm going to start going to some of these. Uh, Kyle Fickler on Zoom is asking about an OE application um, where you don't have control over the bore finish and you might be switching back and forth between E85 and pump gas. And his question is, if you recommend stepping up in oil viscosity um, to help maintain ring seal with E85. <laughs> I'll answer that real quick, right? Short, yeah, short yes. and simple. <laughs> yes, if you, when you add fuel, you need to increase the viscosity of the oil. Uh, all things being equal otherwise, yes, I would I would recommend going up one viscosity grade if you go from pump gas to E85. Very Fair. good, thank you. Kyle, thanks for that question. Um, <laughs> Itching your softballs. Yeah. 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 Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Williams on Zoom asks, um, how do you recommend cleaning the diamond abrasives you have loaded up the stones? Uh, we generally use a glass beater. Uh, that may not be what is recommended by the abrasive manufacturers. <laughs> Ed Kieber may be blowing up your phone right say, about Ed, now. Ed probably got my phone on fire right now. Uh, but we have a, a, a small, inexpensive glass bead box uh, that we use for our abrasives. And it literally uses a glass. I couldn't tell you the number. Uh, if somebody wants to get a hold of me, that's fine. But it, the stuff's almost like powder. It's so fine. This is not a grade of glass that you would clean an intake manifold or a set of valve covers with. This stuff is literally like dust. It is so fine. So we clean them with that, uh, wash them up after that. It seems to work very, very well. We've not had a problem with it, you know, embedding or impregnating mm -hmm. itself into the stone. Uh, so that's how we do it. And it, uh, and I have a lot of, uh, you know, of customers and builders that I work with that do the same thing. And that seems to be a, a, a fairly good way of doing it. For so, those who don't know, yeah. explain why we actually hone things here. Because people might say, why does a ring manufacturer have any knowledge of honing anything? Because you make rings, you don't make cylinders. Yeah, you're, you're, not, you're not an engine manufacturer. All, the rings that we do, the OD profile, this surface of the ring uh, is pre-lapped in. So 
we have three different OD lapping machines out there uh, that will lap the profiles of the ring and to get that shape that we want on it. But that lapping process actually happens in what looks just like a cylinder sleeve. We have to get the right surface finish on it, too rough, tears up the face of the ring, too smooth, takes too long. We've got to get that right finish just like in your cylinder and the rings go in and they cycle back and forth like a butter churn uh, with a diamond slurry, a very fine diamond abrasive in there. And that laps the faces of the ring. So your engine doesn't have to do that. But in doing that, we wear the sleeves out. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a rack of sleeves that goes in. It might be a 4030. By the time we're done using those sleeves for the lapping, well, guess what? They're wore out. They've got to go to the next size. So we are constantly honing. I, I promise you, if we walk out there right now, it's running. Yep. <laughs> uh, that machine we calculate has got to have over a million strokes on it so wow. far. Uh, it's been a workhorse. Excellent. I think the only problem we've had, it broke a belt one time. Uh, you know, I think that's kind of a maintenance item, but that's what we hone. We hone sleeves and it's all for the OD lapping of the rings. And we, we do a lot of it. So it gives us the opportunity to play with different abrasives, different coolants, different oils, and, and see what kind of results we get and playing with different sleeve materials, mm -hmm. gray irons, ductile irons, compacteds. Uh, we've worked with Nicosils. So it gives us the opportunity to play with a lot of different materials and see what those finished results are like. Okay, sorry about hey guys, that. Just, just, just for a second, I wanna Bye go far. Yeah. to the discussion. <laughs> I want to just for a second go back to the discussion about the reverse blueprinting and, and that kind of stuff. And I want to point out something that I think we do that's different than a lot of other shops. You know, traditionally, and I know there's a ton of guys out here that are engine builders and have engine shops and machine shops and whatever. Traditionally, uh, the young guy that comes in, you know, he's the minimum wage worker that's wanting to learn the business or whatever. Where do we start them out? We start them out with the broom and we start them out at the parts cleaning tank, right? So, uh, one of the things I want to point out in what we do is I don't allow the young guys to touch the parts cleaner. And the reason for that is, is that it's probably my least favorite thing to do in all of engine building, machining, assembling, testing. I hate washing parts. I hate scraping parts. I just hate it. But when I'm standing next to the solvent tank is when I learn about the parts. So if I give them to somebody else that doesn't know what to look for and they go in there and clean everything off that was evidence of what the engine was doing, then I lose that opportunity to see what was going on with the engine. So I typically take the younger guys in the shop and I put them on the tour crunch. And I know that sounds crazy, but the reality is I'm watching them and I'm looking over their shoulder and I already know how to go until it clicks or the light comes on. And so do you guys. So the reality is I want them to learn that. I want to make sure it's done right. So I watch them. But the most important job in the disassembly and measurement of the engine is looking at the parts. And so if you got the young guy in the shop cleaning the parts and doing all that, I think I feel like you're missing out on something the engine could be telling you. Yeah. 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 Yep. Perfect, guys. Thank you. Ben is if you're really serious about listening to the engine, used oil analysis goes a bajillion oh, miles. Yeah. Because it's going to show you stuff that your eye can't tell you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, fuel dilution and all that. That's where you, if you really get serious about it, you can see it's funny. I was talking to uh, uh, Mark Cronkowitz and the guys at Gibbs the other day, and he said they could see, because uh, they you know, build engines and they dyno engines for other people, because uh, they know that some of the spec motor stuff out there. He's like, I can see a change in the batches of the oil. Like, when they oh, yeah. get a different batch from the one supplier that one of the their customers uh, uses a different brand of oil and they get different batches. He said, I can see it. I can see what's the change crazy in, about that in the additive yeah. levels. I can see the change in the wear that they've been doing it for so long. They know the numbers are and you see that little delta, even though it's not a huge number that would probably never mean anything to anybody else. But when you see 20 ppm of something forever, next thing you know, it's 35, that's a change. I think what's Sorry. crazy about that is we, we tend to talk about doing oil analysis as if it's this, uh, you know, you, you got to be really serious about engine development work and it's this high end thing. But it's actually one of the least expensive things you can do. It's a billion times less than buying a microscope like I've got over there or heck, even a profilometer. And if these guys are serious enough to put that kind of money in, I'm always surprised that the people I talk to they go, I don't, I don't do any oil analysis. I'm like, why? It's so cheap. Right. I mean, you could do oil analysis for years for the price of one of these things. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> it's, it's nothing. So hundred percent. I've got to throw it in there because it, it is something that I talk with people about almost on a daily basis. Uh, 
you know, they call us up, they, they want us to help them figure out why it did what it did mm -hmm. uh, for the good or the bad. And one of the questions I always throw out is, do you have the used oil that came out of it? And the answer to that 99 out of 100 times is no. no. I'm like, why no. do you want to keep that oil? That drain sample is going to tell you so much information, wear metals, fuel, you know, contamination. It's, it's going to tell us so much about it. Dirt, you know, right. you know, is it, a, you know, are you running in a dirty environment? It's going to show in that oil. So don't throw that oil out. Right. There are so many times. I mean, over the years, it's hundreds of times I've asked that question. It's almost always no. And right. on the, on the rare occasions where they do that information back is so incredibly useful in diagnosing what it did or didn't do. Uh, you know, Lake and I have known each other for years and years before he ever came to work here. And, and part of, you know, our introduction to each other was getting oil analysis done mm -hmm. because I needed to find an outlet, somebody that was, you know, accessible that I can send people to and, and Lake helped me with that because, you know, they've got questions. I've got some of the answers, but there's, there, there's a part of this puzzle that's missing. Mm -hmm. And that piece was that oil analysis. And that filled in the blank. Because when I'm looking at an engine that's got three times what he would call the maximum amount of fuel dilution in it, I think we found the problem. Yeah. All right. Well, um, guys, we got a couple other oil related questions that we can jump to. Um, <laughs> since, since we kind of since we got, since we got on, on that topic. That topic. Uh, some people are asking what some of the differences are between synthetic oil and what you'd use on the dyno or for a break-in. And uh, another guy on Instagram asked, you know, how long you would have to break in an engine um, before you switch to synthetic oil. Okay, well, I'm gonna do a couple of things here. Um, one, all three of us have different videos we've done together uh, really explaining the break-in process. Keith and I did a video where we really go into the details and actually show the different additive levels and different, you know, yeah. break-in oils. Uh, so I'd say as, as a preface to, before I answer the question, go to our YouTube channel. Uh, uh, if you go to YouTube, Total Seal, uh, Piston Rings, we have videos on there where we really get in to depth and show the different additive levels of different break-in oils. And then we actually have another video uh, on there that really explains the break-in process where here's how you should go about breaking in uh, a new set of rings uh, based on our experience and what the oil part of that means. And then Keith and Ben did a video for the Engine Performance Expo, you know, talking about, okay, let's say you don't have a dyno kind of what not to do back to the overfueling and some of the, the things that can get you in trouble there. Uh, we know lean is mean, but you know, rich can get you in trouble too. So that being a preface, the simple answer is for ring break in, what you don't want is more important than anything else. And what I mean by that is what you don't want is a high level of detergent because yeah, that's no, simply yeah. going to slow things down. But like, you know, the old school guys, when they said, oh, we know we need to use, you know, non-detergent, you know, straight 30 mineral-based oil, they may not have known why that worked. And they probably had different theories of why that worked. They were completely wrong. But there was a fundamental reason why that stuff worked. And it wasn't because it was straight 30. No. It was because it was non-detergent. And essentially, the take a really long hour oil seminar and condense it into about uh, 30 seconds here. Uh, at least I'm going to try to do that is that and I the detergent against the ZDDP. So the ZDP is your anti-wear film that can help smooth those valleys, control that break-in process. Detergents compete against that. So with a non-detergent type oil, the ZDP is more free to do its job, which will help chemically seat and seal that that piston ring so that that is um all right straighter you got me on that one <laughs> he's sending me text messages and they're popping up on my screen i'm like ah <laughs> sorry I'll, I'll let you say that one for later uh, <laughs> but um anyway so the, the non-detergent or low detergent is really important and then the other thing is you don't want uh a friction modified oil you know, Molly is 
fantastic at reducing friction and all that. But again, it affects the way the film forms. God damn it. So, you know, that, that's where you don't want that high level of detergent and you don't want that high level of molly. So that's what you don't want. And if you can kind of select your oil by saying, oh, it doesn't have that and it doesn't have that, then you're probably end up in the right place. Now, guys, is there any difference from application to application or, you know, gas versus diesel in terms of, you know, the break-in process or is it the same theory? Uh, same theory. The only thing I've come across, and this has been pretty recent actually, is that with Nicosil, uh, because of how much smoother the surface finish is, I mean, it, it's a very different type of surface. You know, where Keith was drawing these valleys and all this, and Nicosil, because it's the silicon particles, it's like freaking almost the opposite, right? Sure. I mean, it, it's you've got these little nodules sticking up. Yeah, super smooth very smooth, but it's got these little particles that stick up. They're the silicon nodules. So the oil is kind of sitting around those islands of silicon, if, if you will. Um, so with that being the case, it can get you in trouble if that ZDP film becomes too thick. It can almost glaze the cylinder in a sense. So, um, yeah, actually, Jake Raby, who's one of my, my buddies, he's been really working on this stuff really hard. The other day, he uh, put together an air cooled engine, you know, flat four uh, Porsche engine with Nicosil, with conventional, it's, it's our rings, but conventional, no gapless, 0% leak down when he was done. He went through three stages, three different oils, three different steps of break-in process to get there. But that is because he's kind of figured out that, okay, you do some work for gray cast iron in that valley surface finish isn't necessarily the best thing for no. this mountain range surface finish of Nicosil. Completely different animal. Nicosil right. is a, a, a completely different beast. And as, and as Late was saying, it's a, you gotta, you've got to attack it from a completely different perspective. But to kind of go to the root of that question, as far as breaking in gasoline versus diesel uh, without a dyno, you want to get it out there and try to get a load on it as quickly as you can. Uh, extended unloaded run times where the engine's not burning the fuel is bad. We're back to that fuel displacing that oil and losing that film, losing that boundary surface that's protecting those metals from getting scuffed, getting torn up, you know, abraded. Uh, you wanna get that load on there, but at the same time, don't beat it to death. You know, We don't wanna go out and say, oh, 100 pounds of boost, bang, on the pin. <laughs> uh, probably not a good idea, but you wanna get that load on it as quickly as you can, but very, very important to watch that fuel curve uh, during initial run. And I'm, I'm sure Ben's probably got some comments on that because you know that overly rich situation, that initial we'll say meet and greet that you know that mm -hmm. wedding uh you know that honeymoon that we're under during that initial time is is it's, it's pretty fragile it's a you, you want to be careful with it once everything's seated up and everything's happy you can actually get away with a lot but during that uh, initial time uh just kind of like that relationship don't want to go too far but you don't want to not do enough either it's that first impression and i mean i don't have any measured data that I can say, oh, X amount of wear on a ring and a cylinder occurs in, you know, this many minutes. But I can tell you this, and something that probably everybody here is watching can relate to, flat tap at cam. So mm -hmm. uh, everybody that knows anything about me knows that me and Billy Godbold are like two peas in a pod, that Billy's smart and I'm the dumb one. Um, we did so much camshaft break-in testing with the oils and stuff. You know, everyone said, okay, you know, 25 minutes, 30 minute cam break in and all that. We were doing some work with uh, an OE doing some testing. We could find, we found that that mating of the cam to the lifter in a flat type situation, the majority of that occurred in three minutes. So if you got it wrong in the first three minutes, it, you were going to pay for that 
pretty soon. Yeah. But if you could get it right in that first three minutes, you would really have a hard time screwing it up after that. Well, and, and to go on to that with piston rings, because um, you know there are quite a few good articles and, and, and mm -hmm. books about tribology and surface finish. And most of the data that I've had privilege to read kind of reads the same thing with piston rings. Okay. Most of what happens happens in about the first 15 to 20 minutes of runtime on the engine. And, and this will go back to you know all the guys that run these things on, on the dyno. And, 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 you know, and Ben, perfect example. If you've got the right ring, the right oil, the right surface finish, everything happening, you put that on the dyno, you're in. It's I mean, done. It's, yeah. it's, it's a couple of hits. It's over. It's as good as it's going to get. You've done the job. Because yeah, I would say, I would say typically four or five dyno pulls yeah. and ports are dried up and the thing is making, you know, the torque is leveled off and stuff like that. It's, it's broken. It, yeah. it, it's it. But for those guys that, you know, I'll have them on the phone. It's like, yeah, we're on, we're, we're at number 15 and man, she's, she's really starting to come in now. Uh, that just tells you right there, something in your blend and your mix. Uh, it's not happy. Your soup, your soup is is missing. Needs, an, a, needs an adjustment. Yep, needs to put some Cholula in there and spice it up. <laughs> All right. See there, me right. <laughs> <laughs> Can't blame you for that. Um, um, Lake mentioned camshafts there briefly, and we got a question on Zoom about some camshaft selection. Uh, Bruce is asking. <laughs> well then. Well, then yeah, talking yeah. about Ben, this this one's for you. Uh, what are the pluses and minuses of solid roller versus hydraulic camshafts? Uh well, where's where's Billy when you need him, right? But uh, at, at the end of the day, I, I guess the simplest way to say it is a hydraulic camshaft. In my in my world, that's that's streetcar stuff, right? Where the the major benefit of a hydraulic camshaft is little or no maintenance, right? Like. Uh, the primary goal for me, if I was using a hydraulic roller would be nothing other than I don't ever want to take the valve covers off and I want to work on it. As far as getting performance, that's not a variable that I really want to have in the engine. So typically for me, we only build hydraulic roller engines when we're restricted by a class rule or something like that. And so, uh, the, the ability to see what's going on and, and limit variables is always what we're trying to do. And if I put a hydraulic shock absorber in my valve train, then it's just a variable that I, it's much harder to track. So I don't mean to talk down uh, hydraulics at all because there's some extremely good stuff out there. Uh, we've built some great stuff. I have a, a guy with a drift racing engine that's about on his third or fourth season with the same engine with, a, you know, short travel hydraulic rollers on the thing. Uh, so, so it's absolutely doable. But really it's a maintenance issue. If, if performance is the top priority, you're going to end up in a solid roller. And frankly, the quality and the level of uh, solid roller, especially low shock technology that's out there now, we're getting to the point where we hardly ever have to work on that stuff either. We still, out of old fashioned habit, we're checking the lash all the time, but it's rare that we ever have to go in there and change it anymore. So um, I, I guess that's my, my input on that. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Ben. Um, um, ben, ben I don't know, if you have the chat open on Zoom, um, can you see, can you see the question from Dustin there? Yeah. Long, long question. So you want me to read it? We'll talk about well, it. Yeah. If you want to cover that one, I just, uh, I don't know how to break that one down. It's, it's got a lot of different, <laughs> uh, different elements. See what it, it says here. So, uh, Dustin says, Ben, what are the practice or what are the best practices for leaving on a two-step with fuel injection to maximize 60 foot performance in a naturally aspirated car? I'm running, uh, one second here, let me scroll. I'm running a Holly EFI system. I leave on a foot brake two-step. And should the fuel be pulled when the two-step, uh, went on the two-step and then closed loop delayed until converter is flash installed? Also, is there any advantage in increasing or decreasing ignition timing during this phase of the two-step or two-step release, converter flash, smart coil dwell? Uh, there seems to be lots of information for turbo guys online, but not a lot for NA. Okay, a lot, lot to unpack in that one. You're right, Greg. Um, okay, let's start with this. So, uh, leave, getting a getting a naturally aspirated car to leave uh, a drag race starting line is always a challenge, um, and some cars are more difficult than others. Uh, I'll, I'll start with saying that the harder a particular car accelerates, uh, the more challenging it becomes. Right. So, I'll come back to the two step here in a minute. But 
the first thing that we typically find when you have a lightweight car with a bunch of power that really gets after it, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these cars are well over two G's, uh, some momentarily getting up towards three G's leaving the starting line. So the first thing most people think about is in a, uh, in a shared manifold design where we've got a plenum, we have fuel going into the manifold and then cylinders are, are taking uh, fuel. Um, you would think that even with eight individual injectors for each cylinder that you'd have a really well evenly distributed mixture. Sorry, that's not how it works. The next thing that you would think is that, well, the harder the car accelerates, the more the rear cylinders are going to get rich because all the fuel rolls to the back. While the liquid fuel does roll to the back, what you will typically find is that the harder the car accelerates, the richer the front cylinders get, believe it or not. And the reason that that happens is because the part that the oxygen sensor in the tailpipe is actually reading is the, uh, the burned hydrocarbons, the relationship between the actual air fuel mixture and the cylinder. But the part of the fuel that's actually burning in the cylinder is the fuel vapor, not the fuel liquid, okay? So the fuel vapors that are in the manifold, vapor is lighter than air. So when you let the clutch out or you let go of the trans brake and the thick car starts rolling, all of that heavy puddled fuel does tend to roll to the back of the manifold, but it's not actually burning. And therefore it doesn't get seen. It's, it's almost invisible to your O2 monitors. But what you'll see is the lighter hydrocarbon based, you know, the vapors of the fuel, they're being forced forward in the manifold. So your O2 sensor suddenly is reading exactly backwards from what you would think. And you have to do different things um, to make all the cylinders do the same thing. It's been said many times that what, what, what we have is not a single eight cylinder engine, but more eight single cylinder engines, all of that need to be treated appropriately to make the most power. So first and foremost, um, getting a car to leave uh, naturally aspirated for sure uh, is challenging. So you talked a little bit about like what to do on the two step. So the two step is basically an extra rev limiter. And uh, what guys will do is they will have their overall rev limiter to protect the engine. Let's say that's 9,000 RPM or 8,000 RPM or whatever it is, but they might wanna leave the starting line with their, with their right foot all the way on the floor and use a rev limiter and either a trans brake or a clutch pedal or whatever to keep the car from moving. The problem with the rev limiter is there's different ways that we can limit the engine. So for example, one way to limit the engine would be to turn off the fuel for a given cylinder. Uh, and that way the thing compresses and the spark load fires, but nothing happens. The other way would be to turn off the spark for that cylinder, in which case everything else happens the other way. So um, there isn't a perfect answer for what the right way is or isn't, but I'll tell you that um, typically it's more difficult to, um, to limit only uh, the spark, uh, sorry, uh, limit only the fuel. In a plenum-based manifold, you whack the throttle to the floor and you say, oh, I'm just going to turn off the fuel delivery to the engine. The problem is there's still a ton of fuel in the manifold. Right. Yeah. Those cylinders will right. grab that fuel and it'll go straight to the, you know, the main rev limiter, even though you're technically not turning fuel off. Uh, and then, it'll, of course, it'll come back down. But by now, the converter and clutch are all messed up and the car doesn't leave very good. So um, we tend to leave uh, in most of the stuff that we do with either limiting the ignition uh, and, and basically not sparking uh, that cylinder uh, or some combination of fuel and ignition. But what happens is, regardless of that, of any time that you have an EFI system that's using what's called closed loop, for the guys out there that don't know what that means, that means we have an oxygen sensor and it's reading the air fuel ratio mixture coming out of the engine, but just reading it and reporting it back for your logging is called open loop. Actually reading it and making a judgment call on a correction to do on the next engine cycle is called closed loop. And so the closed loop works in, uh, in a basically a rhythm where it samples the mixture in the exhaust, it compares the uh, result of your mixture to what you had set up as your goal or your target, and then adds or subtracts fuel on the next engine cycle. Well, anytime you have a misfire, whether that's intentional from a rev limiter or a plug wire or a spark plug or any you know, valve float, anything like that, anytime you have a misfire, where the cylinder does not completely combust the mixture, you're gonna have unburned hydrocarbons out there in the exhaust pipe that are gonna be interpreted by the O2 sensor as a lean condition. So what'll happen is guys go up on the two-step and then they let go of the button or they let the clutch out and the car starts to roll. And suddenly the O2 sensor, which operates very fast is going, whoa, 
this thing's super lean. I better dump a bunch of fuel into it. And then the car doesn't want to leave very good for the first 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 feet until it cleans all that fuel out. So um, typically I will delay the onset of the, uh, of the O2 or closed loop correction uh, for a period of time after the actual launch, whether that's triggered by a button on the, on the, uh, a line, you know, torque converter um, line lock type situation, or whether it's on the clutch pedal. The other thing um, that will happen is depending on the method you're using to limit the vehicle, whether you're just cutting the spark and letting that fuel go in there or cutting the fuel and, and leaving the spark, you'll need to look for your particular car, what the behavior looks like after the launch before the closed loop takes effect. And another thing that trips guys up is something called transfer delay. You look at a typical Bosch O2 sensor or NTKO sensor, O2 sensor, there can be anywhere from about 40 to about 60 milliseconds of uh, response time between when the sensor samples and when it actually comes up with a reading. Now couple that to the transport delay, which is the amount of time it takes the mixture to leave the exhaust valve in the port and travel however long it is in the exhaust tube to where you have the sensor placed. If you've got a 22 inch long header or 24 inch or a 30 inch long header and you have the O2 sensor placed at the collector, by the time the mixture leaves the cylinder, travels to the sensor and then gets interpreted by the sensor, if you're doing really high RPMs, you know, just take, for example, 6,000 RPM, which isn't even that high. At 6,000 RPM, the engine's doing 720 degrees of crank movement in only 20 thousandths of a second. That's 20 milliseconds. You might have 300 milliseconds worth of total delay between the gas transport and the sensor response time. So you really need to have the tune-up for the engine uh, correct without necessarily relying on help from the O2 sensor before you're going to get the car to be optimum in the 60 foot time. So I'm not saying to turn it off and don't rely on it, but be careful about um, how you're interpreting that data. One last thing I'll say about that is in terms of uh, having good data, if you're going to be serious, you really need to have information from all eight of the cylinders, not just an average, because what you're getting in the tailpipe is not only at the collector, is not just an average of the four cylinders on that bank, but even when you have individual O2s, like we'll have typically 10 in the car, we'll have one in every pipe up close to the head and then one in each collector. But even the one that you get, let's say I'm looking at cylinder number six, three inches away from the port, that's fine. But even that is only an average mixture of what was in the cylinder. Within the combustion chamber, you're gonna have pockets of areas that are rich and lean. And what you need is for even the worst case lean area in the cylinder to have enough fuel to be able to have combustion and support the, the fire. But if you've got areas that are crazy, super rich and areas that are crazy, super lean and the, and the cylinder is not happy and not good at all, it will still end up in the tailpipe reading by the sensor as the average of that mixture. And that may or may not be good. So uh, my answer was probably as long as your question and probably still didn't give you what you wanted, but hopefully that gets you thinking and, and, and going the right way anyway. Yeah, Ben, we, we appreciate that. That was very in depth. And Dustin, thanks for that. Uh, hopefully Ben touched on all the aspects you were looking for. Guys, we got a question on Facebook from Pablo. He's asking about uh, gas direct injection engines versus um, port injection engines and what some of the fundamentals of RVK might be between the two. I never heard of it. <laughs> what do you what do you want to talk about lake <laughs> well it's funny it's a great segue from what you were just answering the last question you were talking about how that hard acceleration changes the fact that there you've got liquid fuel and you got vaporized fuel in the manifold and obviously as the liquid fuels goes back it's displacing the vaporized fuel that's really the the the, the beginning point to answer this gentleman's question about uh, gasoline direct injection, because that's the key with that injector being in the cylinder. It, there's so little time for that atomized fuel, which is still liquid at that point, to actually vaporize. Yeah. So what you see is you typically get a lot more fuel wash in a uh, direct injection engine. So you're, you're gonna need more, more RVK. More. Yeah. 
and, and way more uh, to get quiz me and him ever you're gonna say oh yeah less rbk oh, it's just just yeah. flat that thing out yeah let, less is down. more yeah, yeah, yeah you're never yeah. gonna hear us say that yeah. Other than maybe a tiny little thin ring pro stock engine, uh, there's not a lot of reason. Yeah, there's there That's are some exceptions. exceptions. That, there, yeah, there's there always an exception to the rule. You Most know. of the time, more is more is better. Yeah, in this case, it, it is. And you and you know me, I hate more is better. Uh, it's like one of my antithesis of life. Like no, it's, typically it's not. Balance yep. is right. And and this is the case here too. Probably is that you know you really need to have enough RVK to hold the oil because you're going to need that seal because you're going to get fuel wash when you have direct injection, especially if you start going E85 with direct injection, something like that, you're going to need it. Uh, and, so for the, and for the engine builder guys out there, another thing to be super careful and critical of is piston shape and design. Um, oh. Guys have talked about, uh, they nicknamed it, you know, the, the deflector, the sugar scooper, you know, a million different names out there. But the pocket that's in the piston there to direct and deflect the fuel that's being injected is very critical for avoiding so much direct impingement of the fuel that's bouncing off the piston, getting right on the cylinder wall. So it's probably even more challenging with a DI engine to keep uh, during the break-in period to, to not be too rich and have all that extra fuel on the cylinder wall. It's probably more of a challenge in a DI engine than even, uh, than even a regular carburetor or, or port injected engine. Well, back to your previous point about the how homogenous is that charge across the the combustion chamber? It's yeah. really going to be challenging because you essentially you have 180 degrees less time in terms of the crankshaft rotation with the DI engine to get all that happy. Yeah, I mean piston shapes for a DI engine are a lot like turbocharger compressor wheels. Everybody's got a better one in the aftermarket, but very few people have any data to support that. Well, other thing too, that I mean, the first time I saw one of them, that was like, wow, I wasn't expecting to see that. And what I'm talking about is the intake port design on the LT1 direct injection engine. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, for most of us who were you know, engine guys who love engines and think this stuff's cool, you're like, okay, I don't have fuel, so I'm gonna have a straight shot. Why, why would I do any kind of turn motion for mixture and tumble, all that stuff? You wouldn't need that, just straight in. Yet you look at that production engine and that thing looks like the freaking, what's that uh, house that's all unlevel at Disney World? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it's the most jacked up weird port I've ever seen. I'm like, why did they do that? What moron came up with that? And Escher painting with everything going. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But the reality is they're trying to create that tumble that and swirl yeah. so that you have turbulence to try to improve the mixture of the fuel in the air in the combustion chamber. So it's like, it's, you know, they didn't do it by accident. They realized- you know, one, one thing to point out there, Lake, is that um, your perspective is coming from the uh, sort of the viewpoint of a racer, right? A guy that's only really interested in more power. When we talk about why did the OEM, why did GM do that? So much of their direction was, um, was steered by packaging in the car. Mm -hmm. uh, also, what is way more difficult for them than how much power they can make is emissions. And so, Typically, when you look at a maximum effort performance engine that has no regard for fuel economy, fuel emissions, or any of that kind of stuff, you're going to see ports that are designed a lot more like what you just imagined it would look like, where anything you do in the port to get swirl or tumble will always come at the expense of volumetric efficiency, right? Because uh, you're effectively shrinking uh, the, the, the flow diameter of the port with some of that boundary layer, right? But they did that intentionally because what was more important to them than maximum power was a reasonable amount of power, but having, uh, you know, cleaner emissions, better fuel economy to meet cafe standards, so on and so forth. So when we start with how do we design an engine to meet a goal, guys like us, we tend to go, I don't care how much power does it make and what RPM can I turn it to? But that's not always the goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's why those ports on that LT1, LT4, those type of engines don't look the way that you or I might try to make them look. You're right. It's a great point because yeah, if idling at 500 RPM, 750 RPM at a stoplight, that tumble, that swirl, that inefficient port is atomizing, vaporizing fuel, making for yep. cleaner emissions. 
for how those cars were intended to be used. Yeah, I mean, we we look at an engine like that that can idle at you know literally 500 RPM and just that's amazing. You know, we we tease guys all the time. They go, "Oh, I turned my engine 7,800 RPM." I'm like, "Yeah, we call that high idle around here. That's nothing." You know, so uh, when I think about how do you make an engine idle at 500 RPM, that's that's mind blowing. You know. Yeah. When you go back to what the you know the OE's goal versus our goals, your goals. Yeah. You know what they needed it to do, what you wanted to do, are two different things. And why they build it the way they do it, the way versus the way we do it. One of the things I've noticed, ring-wise trends with you know we brought the DI engine mm -hmm. because that is a again another one of the variables that we have to talk about. Yep. You know what is the customer doing? Because you you watch the point now, and I'll pick on GM mm -hmm. uh, when we were in the port injection, watching the rings get literally down to NASCAR sizes, OE yeah. factory with a warranty. With the advent of DI, I'm actually watching them go back the other way. They're getting bigger. They're going higher tension. It's a so much more difficult environment because of the liquid fuels, what we're dealing with, the lack of atomization. They, you know, that environment is so much more difficult to work with. And we're watching, you know, from an OE point of view, watching these ring sizes. Again, we're not talking big, you know, big stuff, but bigger than they were, higher tension than what they were going back the other direction. So, so hey, let's let's talk tools. about that for a minute um, because we spent a lot of time earlier talking about what's changed in block material, what's changed in uh, honing technique and surface prep and all that. Um, but one thing that doesn't get talked about probably enough, especially uh, because you guys sell rings, is let's talk about what's different in rings now. I mean, we know the sizes are different. Well, at least maybe some people do. And and look, I get it. Not everybody's going to have the 20 thou diamond finish, double whammy throwdown. But I, I tell guys all the time, you know, like the best value going in the planner right now is that 0 0.9, 0 0.9, two millimeter package you guys sell. That's like, man, what a killer performance package for not a ton of money as compared to like, oh, I used to run a, you know, 16, 16, whatever, you know. So materials have changed, right? Where we've gone away from the ductile and molly and that kind of stuff you know, materials have changed a bunch, but so have the ring sizes, but take a minute to talk about uh, what, what made that change happen and, and why, and what's like available. I'm always, I feel like every time I talk to you guys, I go, Hey, what's the latest in coatings or treatments or what's out there that we know, but not necessarily everybody is into that. Maybe only because they don't know it's available. So tell us a little bit about that kind of stuff. Well, the, the, the 0 0.9, 0 0.9 package evolved, uh, again, from NASCAR and pro stock, those levels always, you know, it, I've been doing this a long time, like most of us. And if you'd have asked me 24 years ago, you know, could we service a ring this size into a production type vehicle? I'd have told you you're nuts. You know, the 16th inch ring was the thin ring at that point in time, but the material technologies have evolved so far. Mm -hmm. The advent of the different types of steels that we work with, the coatings that we work with, it, it is amazing how durable this little thin lightweight ring, this one happens to be radially gas ported as well, will survive in this world. It's because of the material technology. But well, we talk about this dimension, you know, Ben mentioned 0.9 in, in thousands, about 35.4, very thin ring axially. But what also has changed so much is this dimension, the, the radial depth. This is really as important, if not more important, because when I've got a ring, with a really deep radial depth, like a 16th inch ring hat would have, say 185, 190 thousandths of an inch, it's it's very stiff. It really doesn't want to move and follow the bore as bores distort. And in a, you know today's you know everything's an aluminum block, aluminum mm -hmm. cylinder. Things move around a lot. But when I reduce this dimension, it really lets that ring bend and move and follow that bore distortion so much better. This dimension is actually, you know, if you think about it, you know, going back to the drawing board, you know, if I look at this, making this dimension, the radial depth, the ring doesn't have the ability to flex. It doesn't have the ability to move. Uh, I mean, it's just, you know, this bag, when I'm holding it this way, it really doesn't want to flex. It doesn't want to move. But when I hold it up like this, making that radial depth shallower, well, guess what? It, it moves all over the place. It's very flexible. It's very conformable. So getting that conformability, reducing this dimension really allows the ring 
to flex and move and follow that bore. This is a, a big part of the thin ring package days, not only the height, but it's the depth that allows better bore conformability within the ring. And this is something you're seeing that the OEs are jumping on. The race world's been on it. We're producing rings today. They're as thin as 80, 85 thousandths. They are literally smaller than an oil ring rail. And it's really about that ability to fold, flex, bend, and follow bore distortion. So, as, so, as so Keith, said, what what generated the push to go that way from the old style where the ring is a spring, right? Like we have this big giant thing pushing against the cylinder wall with mechanical tension. Uh, is it the material, like the steels that you started getting? Like what facilitated, we know why we want to do that now because you've explained it, but what facilitated the ability to get there? The, the steels, the material technologies, the, like you said, the why was the question always. I've never been to a show ever, whether it be a SEMA or a PRI, where somebody came in and said, you know what? I really like about 20 less horsepower. I just, it's just more than I can handle. Yeah. You know, the, the tone constant, this thing down. Yeah. Tone this thing down. I just can't, I, I just can't handle it. They always want more. And it's that constant, you know, push that drive to find more. And, and one of those is how do we reduce friction? How do we keep lowering that friction? Because as we all know, the biggest contributor to that friction in that engine is that ring package. So how can we get that friction down? And, and as 40%, you were, you were saying, getting less mass in the part, less tension, less spring. How do I reduce that, but yet have a part that's survivable in today's extreme environments? And that's material technologies. It's about the metals. Same thing goes coatings. to the blocks, coatings, the materials that we're making the cylinders out of, the materials that we're making the rings out of. Again, these materials are not something 25, 30 years ago, we would have even looked at, but you know, the ability of this, the access to these materials and the equipment, the machines, to allow us to produce these are more available today than they were again 20 30 years ago so, the so then so then the so then to take that to the next level we've gotten so far away from you know i was joking the ring is a spring right mm -hmm. now you guys are actually taking advantage of combustion pressure using gas ports either in the piston in the old-fashioned way and now the new way is to in in the ring use use the pressure that we're creating through combustion to create ring seal um, so much, so much so that I'll, I'll show you guys an example, like everybody out there is probably using these uh, tapered ring compressors, you know, one of the challenges to having these tiny little low tension rings is when you take the ring compressor and you got your fingers there and you're holding the rings in the groove and you put it down in there into the taper, when you let go, there's so little tension on the rings, they just flop and fall out of the groove so you can't put it in there. <laughs> we use stuff around here that's so tiny and so small, uh, you physically can't do it and so I take my, my ring compressor. And I put it in the middle and I put a slot in it so that I can hold my fingers <laughs> until it gets in there, you know, so that you can keep it from falling out of the groove. I didn't invent that anyway. A, a buddy of mine showed me that. And I go, man, I'm so dumb. Why didn't you think of that? Yeah, that, that's on pretty the, cool. On the but that was it Kazi, we'll was it? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't actually. Okay, thank God. Okay, right. so. well, that, would be, that would be a totally Kazi invention, right? Like everybody else on the planet, it's it. Kazi made it. Yep. Yeah, know? absolutely. So I got a bunch of these total seal ones with holes in them now that uh, that I it's it's so much better to put those little the thin ring things. compressor. The, the thin ring compressor. The thin no, ring I, compressor, yeah. So now, Keith, I think you guys even make those in different tapers too, don't you, for that yeah, reason? Our, our solution to that, the typical ring compressor that you buy today has about a five-degree taper. So what we've done for the very shallow radial rings is to change that to two, two degrees. degrees. So yeah. that helps to keep it in the funnel, uh, makes it easier to get in there. But I kind of like Ben's idea. You never know. We may have a, you know, a Rev A. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, on there well, pretty quick. <laughs> you can send any royalties to EFI University on that. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, right, but guys. using the lower the ring tension is getting, the less ability the ring has mechanically by itself to seal that cylinder. So that means the more we're relying on the combustion pressure to make that seal, which means now the surface finish matters way more than it used to. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, right there, Greg. Yeah, yeah. No, those are all great points. Lake, you and I have talked about how, you know, the piston rings no longer, you know, it's not a structural part. It doesn't need to right. be, you know, as stiff as not it a wrist pin. was. And, right. It's not okay. the wrist pin. The wrist pin is a structural component. Yeah. The ring is not. It's a seal. You wouldn't have a iron rear main seal and expect it not to leak. Right, right. So um, the idea is it needs to be a seal. So I think to Eric's point, Eric's question is, is it worse to run a top ring as high up on the piston with as high up on the piston with DI? Also, how much smaller is the crown 
uh, on an extreme radio wall deal like a hundred thousandths or less. Uh, the the face of the ring on a, like a hundred uh, wall ring, which is what I'm used to from the NASCAR yeah. stuff, right? Uh, yeah, the, the, the barrel face is the same. It's just, you're taking that, like Keith said, you're taking the tension away. Um, with a DI engine, so one of the cool things about DI engines is from the factory, they all have oil all sprayers. So they've got uh, piston oilers. So yeah, put that baby yeah. up high, let her seal, let her eat. The, the, people ask me all the time, I get, you know, I get the question, how far down is the top ring need to be in? I said, the, the, from my point of view, from a ring point of view, the determining factor is the valve pocket. Mm -hmm. You wanna put that ring on as high on the piston as you can get it and not interfere with the B dimension on the valve pocket. That's where you stop. Uh, there, there's a lot of preconceived notions about where rings need to be. And the whole package ends up being compromised because we, oh, it's gotta be down this far. I've gotta have this much room. I've gotta have this length rod because I've gotta get that magic rod ratio. And <laughs> next, you know, they're trying to put a support rail for the oil ring into the second ring groove because nothing fits. Uh, we have to engineer it the other way around. We figure out where the rings need to go on the piston. I can put the top ring this high, figure out how much material you need between the lands. Remember that area between the first and second ring, this is what's supporting the load. This is what the top ring's pushing down on. So once we've calculated where all this needs to go, hey, then I can stick this much connecting rod at it. But as far as how to hide the top ring goes, this dimension, that B dimension on the valve pocket, obviously we don't want a valve pocket gas port in the piston. <laughs> Uh, that, that has a tendency to, well, this piston, it's cooked like the that. rings, it welded them, it's, it's having problems. But that dimension is so critical, you want to get the ring as high as you can, but without interfering with that dimension. I mean, just for a kind of thought, Keith saw them the other day, the modern racing two-stroke engines, 14,000 RPM engines, have a headland ring in them. They, 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 and that's, for those that don't know, the headland's a very, very old design. And I'll, again, we'll go back to the board. Is gas porting before there was gas porting? It's, 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 yeah, it's Keith, 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 make sure you draw, it. draw it pretty big so people can see it, yeah. All righty. This is the ring groove that the headland fits into. That is the crown of the piston, the top. The headland ring is what would be known as like a dike style ring. With the exception, the ring goes all the way up to the top. So we actually have this area exposed. It's not captured inside the ring land like a dike's ring. So this area is actually exposed to the flame front and allowing us to get all that combustion pressure back in here. It's a very old design, but it's it's coming back around because it gas loads like no man's business. Yeah, it's like essentially a vertically gas ported ring. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's style yeah yeah we have a we couple have questions on youtube that i want to make sure we get to um we got someone asking about detonation and whether that's a function you don't want you it you don't want but he's asking if it's a, a function of cylinder pressure or the compression ratio or is it other factors yeah yeah uh, well, at, the, at the end of the day, take that one bad. <laughs> at the end of the day, the fuel that you're using is going to detonate when you get to X temperature, right? Like it's temperature mm -hmm. pressure. Direct. Oh, so whether you're getting there, you know, the old question of should I use, uh, I think we were talking earlier, earlier like uh, low, low boost and high compression or uh, low compression and high boost, you know, but so many of those things are a variable based on uh, the fuel that you're using. And so uh, detonation can be caused by high cylinder pressure. It can also be caused by too early of ignition timing or, you know, uh, you know, so I don't mean to confuse it and, and lose the issue there, but it's so fuel dependent and, and just, you know, just thinking compression ratio only is a little short sighted. It's, it's not the only thing that, that matters there. Yeah. It's, it's the auto ignition temperature of the fuel and that mm -hmm. will vary by fuel. Sure. Yeah. And even like guys go, well, I got a quote unquote pump gas tune up, right? Well, that's dangerous if you think about it. Cause what did you tell me? Like there's like 47 different active blends. 47 different blends in, of pump gas across the U S today. So, you know, you fill up in this state and you drive until you run out of gas. And now you're in that state and you're, you're quote unquote, you know, 89 octane uh, anti-knock index, you know, R plus M over two deal that's only telling one little piece of the story. The octane isn't the whole story. It's also the volatility and, you know, 
vapor pressure and, and these other things that are going to make a difference in how it behaves in the engine, not, not just octane. Yeah, let's, let's dig in a little bit deeper there because um, that's a great point. It could be the same octane fuel, but because the reed vapor pressure is different, now that fuel, if it doesn't vaporize, it can't cool the intake charge. It's the heat of vaporization. It's that liquid fuel turning into a vapor that's actually taking heat out of the combustion chamber, which is I remember giving you that uh, margin before you reach auto ignition temperature. I remember very little about seventh grade other than my science teacher would always, you know, repeat the mantra that evaporation is a cooling process, right? So uh, if you have that- Anybody in, the, uh, in Arizona or New Mexico about that, right? <laughs> Absolutely, cool. yeah. So, you know, uh, when you think about, well, why would they do that? They need to change the ability of the fuel to vaporize based on your geographic location and the time of year. If you're in New York, say in uh, January and a big winter storm's coming through and you have a fuel that does not vaporize very well, it'll be very difficult to get your car to actually start. And then when you do get it to start, you're gonna have such poor exhaust emissions because of the unvaporized fuel making its way through the engine uh, that it's just not, it's not ideal. So what they do is you, you've heard winter blend, summer blend, that kind of stuff. So at various points throughout the year, the EPA mandates to the, those fuel suppliers uh, what the, the, you know, volatility or vapor pressure of the fuel that they're allowed to sell can be. So not even necessarily just regionally, because the kind of gas that is needed for, say, Arizona in the summertime, if I use that really easy to vaporize fuel out of New York and took it to Arizona, before you could get the engine to start, it would be vaporizing and coming out the vent tube in the gas tank. You wouldn't even get to use it. You get things like vapor lock and whatever else, right? So that that leads me to the point of like, where we are here, we have a big lake. I live in Lake Havasu, Arizona. It's always hot here, but it's a big destination for performance boat guys. And they'll spend tens and tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars on multiple high-end racing engines for their boat. Then they'll drag it over here and they'll stop by the airport on the way into town and buy ab gas because <laughs> octane thinking this is a good thing. Now, in fairness, they're right. It makes their engine not blow up. But that's because it totally gives away all the performance. You're talking about ab gas as a fuel that's blended specifically to remain stable at all different barometric pressures, altitudes, temperatures, put it in the wing and leave it for six months before you fly. So it's, it's the last thing you would really want for a high RPM, high speed, turbo blown, you know, high compression type engine. But because it's four bucks a gallon, everybody thinks this is the magic solution. It's high octane and it's low dollars. So this is great, but you wasted all that effort making a high performance engine and then putting a fuel that's designed for something else in it. So there's a reason you look at Sunoco, VP, all these fuel suppliers, you go to their website and they got 50 different blends of race fuel, because in my opinion, the fuel is just like any other component of the engine. You spend all this time selecting just the right camshaft and just the right manifold and just the right cylinder heads, and then just dump race fuel in there. Well, if the race fuel isn't matched as a component of the engine, like every other part for the application, you're giving away performance. Bingo. Now, well, I'll touch on the Avgas thing real quick. Runs great in my lawnmower. Starts <laughs> every time. That's right. Weed whackers in, in uh, April. Wonderful. Yeah. It works fantastic. But I, I really want to touch on the fuel situation because, again, dealing with all the different people that we deal with, uh, I'll use this piston just again, for example. This thing's completely annealed the top ring. It's collapsed the top ring. It's welded it into the piston. But the perfect example is, well, you know, I had race fuel in it, but which race fuel? The atomization characteristic. And so many people don't embrace that. How Sunoco works is different than how VP works, which is different than how Turbo Blue works. They all may be 110 octane, but this is a completely different fuel. You've got to look at, you know, mm -hmm. your fuel settings, timing, uh, just because you have that fuel in it doesn't mean your tune-up that was great on VP is going to work on Sunoco or, you know, pick your brand. These are, you know, you can't just throw the fuel in it and go, hey, it's good to go. Right. Uh, these kinds of things happen a lot. We see them, they come in, it's like, hey, why did the engine do this? And once we start going through all the questions, we go, finally, you know, and it might be the first question, it might be the hundredth question that, that, yeah. that finally gets answered. Oh, yeah, by the way, you know, went to this racetrack, they didn't have my brand, 
and I put this in it, bang, there's your, there's your ring problem. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so uh, very, well, very good. Excellent. Um, guys, we got a question on Facebook from Ricky. He's talking about a high performance aircraft application that's air cooled and has a typical bore size over five inches. And he wants to know about the approach uh, you guys would use for ring packages and for honing procedures. Well, aircraft cylinders are, are kind of a, we'll say a unique situation because many, many, many aircraft cylinders are a nitrided steel. Again, we go back to the absolute importance of this tool and having access to this tool. And I'll, I, I will throw this out and I'm not picking on anybody out there. Of the hundreds and hundreds of aircraft cylinders I've seen in my lifetime and had the opportunity to measure, I have, and, and again, I'm not picking on anybody. I've measured maybe three or four that were even in the ballpark of where they needed to be because these are very, very hard. I've had aircraft cylinders over 550 Brunel come wow. out here. Extremely hard, but they took it to the guy. The guy honed it. It put scratches in it and away they went. You know, they've taken it now. They're at 10,000 feet. They've got, you know, the ability, think about it. You know, you've got a, a, an engine that you as the operator of that engine have manifold pressure and exhaust gas temperature and the ability to change your fuel mixture on the fly. Mm -hmm. Why don't these have O2 sensors in them? <laughs> uh, so, hey, the wrong guy. That's yeah, the yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> better hit the pilot. Yeah, yeah. Ask uh, the pilot so, over there. So aircraft stuff can be difficult because you have that ability to adjust fuel mixtures. Cylinder finish is super, super important in these things. Getting it right, getting that oil retention, giving it that, I'll call that insurance package mm -hmm. against going overly lean, overly rich, giving it that opportunity to live. Uh, now, talking about the over five inch, we do do a lot of these engines mm -hmm. uh, in a performance application. Some of them have uh, what are known as half keystone style rings uh, and rectangular rings. A half keystone is a ring that's kind of shaped like a wedge on the top, flat on the bottom. So we do work with these rings. We do a lot of gapless rings for the aircraft industry, trying to, you know, for the performance industry, trying to help these things seal up. But uh, yeah, we do produce a lot of rings for them. Uh, we work with different people on different sizes. I've got quite a few race engines today that have very, by comparison, very thin rings. We're down to 1 16th, 1 16th. I've got some 043 rings uh, and they survive extremely well. But again, we go back to, it's a package. You've got to make sure the cylinder's right, the piston's correct, that this whole group works together. So- Hey no Keith, on, a air, on an aircraft cylinder, what about the concept of choke where they make the bore smaller up at the top versus at the bottom? That's pretty controversial. So what's your take? It's, I, I think the idea is good. The actual implementation in the machine shop, I see to be very flawed. Um, gotcha. I'll go back to like the NASCAR world, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, you know the, the, the NASCAR Dodge engines yeah. uh, with the open deck. Yeah. Uh, they were choke honing those. And when they got the choke right, uh, it was great when it worked great. Yeah. It was awful when they missed. Yeah. And that was, <laughs> it was if, if they got it right, it was pretty good. But it, it's really, uh, it's, it's a theory. Uh, how much choke does it really need? How, you know, who's done the testing, who's done the development to say that 2000s, 3000s, 4000s choke is the right number for that engine at that temperature with that fuel. Uh, it's, it's a debatable subject. I think the theory is good, but there's an awful lot of flaws in there, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like when I fly my airplane and I look at cylinder head temperatures, which are taken up there near the crown, you know, uh, you know, I'll see anything from as low as, you know, in, in flight, depending on altitude and power levels, you'll see anything from as low as, you know, 280 or 90 degrees to 400. So uh, depending on what you choose for a mixture, you know, so the problem is like, okay, well, at what point the idea of choke is make it smaller at the top where the combustion is, the cylinder is going to grow more there, blah, blah, blah. But okay, so does that mean when I run the thing excessively rich and my cylinder head temp is lower that I actually have more engine friction? And vice versa, when I lean it out, I have less engine friction, but I pay for it in other ways. I mean, it's a really complicated subject when you let a dumb pilot play with the mixture control. <laughs> Your words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I was talking about me, so. And, and, and for those who don't understand, again, we'll go back to the drawing board. When we're talking about show honing, we're talking about a cylinder that we're actually honing like this. We're gonna actually hone it smaller at the top, larger at the bottom, with the desire that as it comes up to temperature, I actually create a straight bore as the engine comes up to town. 
correcting that friction, getting the right piston wall clearances. But I, we're, we're at that, as Ben stated, you know, we've got this huge range in temperatures is different. You know, so at what point in time is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. Now, is that is that done just primarily on an airplane application or are there other applications where that's that's factored in like that? I, the only I'll say this from my, you know, from where I'm at sitting in my chair, the only two engines I've ever seen that had that as an intention was the aircraft, the Continental Lycoming style engine and the Dodge NASCAR block. <laughs> so none of the, none of the Volkswagen or air cool Porsche guys ever did that? No, not that I've ever seen. I've never seen one that way. Again, not that they couldn't. Not, not, but that may not from a factory. Deal, but not right? from a factory. Gotcha. No, I've never yeah. seen a Volkswagen Subaru Porsche uh, ever designed it. Oh, hey, this has to have 3,000s choke in it. I've never seen that. Yeah. Okay. There's okay. a couple more fuel questions here, Greg. So, uh, yeah, I've got one that's a direct message to me, so you guys aren't seeing it. Um, it's from Bill here on Zoom. He's got a 7.4 liter um, Gen 6 Chevy. And... Uh, He's been seeing some oil consumption problems with it. And he says there's no sign of ring end gap budding. So he's just curious if you guys have any insight um, into the honing process or other items that could be responsible for the oil consumption. Well, I mean, we, we need to know a little more about yeah. it as far as uh, what, what ring set it has in it. What yeah, he's got, he's got two 564s and a 316. Um, with a molly top, a cast second, and a standard tension oil ring. Okay, yeah, pretty, that, that's about as rudimentary as it yeah, gets. So uh, cylinder bore prep can have a little to do with it. We want to make sure the cylinder finishes are correct. Uh, just throwing numbers out. Typically on a thing, an engine like that, I didn't mean to call it a thing, an engine like that, you're going to look for RPK numbers in the 10 to 15 range. Uh, you're going to be looking for RK numbers somewhere in the, I'll call it 35 to 45 range. And the valley number somewhere in the 50, 55, pretty basic numbers for a block like that. Good straight round bore, bore geometry. Mm. But one of the things that I battle with this is the high volume oil pump. I, I get a lot of, we'll call it street RV utility applications where you know, we've got a very basic engine. It's not a race engine. It's not high RPM. It's not any of those things, which I don't know what this particular one is. And we put a high volume pump in it and we now flood everything we can loose clearances loose clearances they've loosened up the rod a little bit maybe put a different rod on the crank maybe the side clearances are looser now we end up flooding everything this is a fairly common thing to see happen and we just end up overwhelming the parts especially valve guides valve guide seals valve breaker more so than the ring uh, so that's a a fairly common thing that i see happen in in street light utility vehicles uh, where everything looks right, it looks like we honed it right. We've got a pretty conservative ring package on it. Uh, we're just simply flooding everything with more oil than it can deal with. Yeah. So another thing that we'll see, uh, Keith, in that is that particular engine comes in a lot of like marine applications, where uh, especially if they're not a closed cooling system and they're using seawater for cooling, you can have dramatic changes in engine temperature. So that means bore clearance. That means you know oil temperatures. That kind of stuff are pretty varied. A guy drops it in the dock and then fires it up and then whacks the throttle as soon as he gets out of the no-wake zone or whatever. Uh, totally different engine compared to what it's going to be uh, after he's got some heat in the thing. So between that and the fact that you take that engine in a marine application, they do exactly what you talked about. The big giant rod clearance and spilling oil everywhere and got the extra protection of the high volume pump. And, you know, then, then they got to run the 50 weight oil. You know, it's like we just stack all the chips against us in an application like that. So uh, it's not really uncommon to see a lot of oil consumption in engines like that. Well, so I guess it's industrial, like maybe a stationary engine. Um, based on what, if this is the right thing, that's, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, that's board geometry and surface finish. Because yeah. that big giant ring package should never have that problem. No. And if you're running in that application with a standard volume pump, that's 100% a board geometry surface finish issue. Stationary yeah. engines, you know, as Lake just said, they, they, that's a whole different environment. That's a whole different set of rules and uh, and bill, bill just weighed in uh he said it's an industrial application yeah yeah yeah, yeah we we see that he, he yeah. did that to everybody yeah that's a that's a that's a different beast so you know we're generally running at you know a, a fair amount of throttle hard load uh but not wide open throttle so we're actually making a little bit of vacuum inside the engine uh so yeah board finish and board geometry really becomes a a, a big thing on that that may be a situation where you want to reach out 
uh, to you know, myself or Lake directly, we can kind of go over what you're doing, how it's being honed, uh, because that, like you said, that is a different environment. At the same time, we go back to the high volume pump because I do have people using the big Chevy in these kinds of applications, putting high volume pumps in where they, they just simply don't need it. One other thing to throw in there, we talked about the 564s, 564s, 316 spring package. Some of the later Gen 6s, as you mentioned, big block pistons actually use a very shallow radial depth 564 spring. Uh, the typical 360, I said 564, sorry, 316 O ring, the typical 316 O ring in a big block Chevy is going to be about 200 thousandths depth. I'll use this big monkey, you know, measuring from the inside, outside to the inside, that depth, the typical 360 O ring is going to be around 200 thousand feet. That assembled depth of that O-ring, we put the rail and the expander together. Uh, a lot of the late pistons used a very shallow 564 O-ring, about 145 thousandths deep. These are actually low tension oil rings. They've gone from around 20 pounds of oil ring tension down to about 14, 15 pounds of oil ring tension. So if we combine that application with that low tension oil ring and a high volume oil pump, where again, as Lake said, we're stacking all those chips up against it and, and pretty much looking for the you know, cause and effect. Yeah. All right, so Bill did send across the, um, some honing specs over here in the chat to everybody. Yeah, and essentially because you're, I mean, the, the EHN 116, yeah, that's, that's a good roughing stone. Yeah. But the fact that you're taking three thou with the 512 means that all you have for your base finish is a 512, which is, a, I think it's a 280. Uh, it's 220. 220. Yeah, 220. Uh, and then you're hitting it with the brush after that, depending upon how much you're taking off the brush. Yeah, there's probably not enough RVK left in there to run in that continual state like that. Um, then other what you're doing for breaking oil. I mean, really, this conversation is probably best to have offline. Call yeah. one of us. Yeah. 623-587-7400 uh, is the number here. You get a hold of one of us. Uh, email lake at totalseal.com, Keith J, totalseal.com. One of us will take care of you because, yeah, we could spend probably an hour, 30 minutes here on this conversation and bore everybody else to tears uh, <laughs> trying to sort that out, you know. Yeah. But I did see a couple of questions about fuel I wanted to answer, though, before we got you. Yeah, to. yeah, so I'm there's two. How long is it going to be till we get unleaded or leaded fuel is banned here, like in Australia? Uh, that's a question for the EPA. Uh, write your congressman. <laughs> So I got to say on that one. The other one is it better to break in with leaded fuel only if your engine's running on leaded fuel. There's no, I would not put a leaded fuel in an engine just to break it in. No. Nah. Uh, yep, fair enough. Um, guys, we got a question on YouTube. Um, I lost it here. Hold on. Oh, here it is. Um, it's for Ben. Uh, he's asking how critical is equal length primary header tubes versus headers with minimum number of bends and different lengths? It, well, um, being an expert at almost nothing, I'll just give you my opinion. Uh, and so that is the number of, length, a number of bends and stuff I could almost care less about. Uh, getting the primary diameters and lengths correct is a critical and it's you know the question is how important is it well it's only as important as you care to make the most power you can right so we have a saying around here that good enough isn't good enough so that means like you got to decide like okay is the next step to, to eke out that last little bit of power worth the dollars that i would have to spend to get it o only you can answer that question but if you said how would i optimize the engine uh, exhaust properly then the lengths and diameters matter a million times more than the shape and direction of bends, in my opinion. Very good. Um, ben, you know, sticking on a, a tuning uh, topic here, you know, you and I have had conversations uh, earlier. You mentioned something about uh, guys using stock computers, you know, ECUs, but not having the, you know, a stock application. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about what some of those pitfalls are that, you know, you see guys uh, getting into yeah. tuning? Yeah, I mean, a question kind of came by me the other day that said like, you know, what what should I do? I'm building this engine or whatever, you know, do you think I should just break it in on the stock ECU before I go to my aftermarket, you know, whatever? 
And my answer is, well, you're not building a stock engine. And so you don't have a stock camshaft, stock compression ratio. You don't have stock fuel injectors anymore. Like the last thing you'd want to do is put the stock computer in there, keeping in mind that the OEM application is almost never centered around how much power can we make. And so it's always on primarily exhaust emissions and secondary cafe standards, which is fuel economy. So unless those are your goals, you know, and if they were, you wouldn't be building a high performance racing engine anyway. Uh, unless those are your goals, you would want to not do that. So what I typically tell guys is if you're already planning on going to XYZ brand aftermarket computer, do that and get somebody, if you're not capable by yourself, get somebody to help you build a startup kind of break in calibration. But the biggest, you know, sort of danger zone to avoid is Keith talked all about the cereals. Everybody thinks, oh, just be safe and make it really rich. Well, you know, what I text Blake earlier and I almost, I almost, uh, shouldn't say it, but I, I text. <laughs> said lean is mean, you know, and I said, well, lean is mean, but rich is a bitch, right? So uh, be careful about being on either side of that spectrum because uh, more isn't better, right? Uh, so, um, and, and it's complicated because the subject of stoichiometry and air fuel ratio and lambda comes into the play. But the reality is, uh, you know, cylinder pressure is your friend. So breaking the engine in under a little bit of a load is, is uh, always preferable to unloaded and, and not loaded engines. Um, so finding that balance between, you know, how long can I stay loaded at this Lambda mixture before I, you know, anneal that top ring, uh, is more art than science, I would say. And it's, it's, uh, there is science to it, but I guess what I'm getting at is, uh, most people in, a, in, you know, involuntarily participate in one of the test to failure analysis programs, meaning, uh, you tested and it failed and now you get to analyze why you didn't mean to do it that way, but that's how it ends up being. So there is a there is an error on the side of caution, kind of safety, but I think people go way overboard. You know, if some is good, more is better is definitely not the answer when it comes to tuning. Very good, very good. Well, guys, we're uh, we're getting close here to the two hour mark, and uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I know we can talk about engines all day, and, and everyone here loves it. Um, but uh, I think we're going to wind it down for now, and, and hopefully, you know. The invite is uh, out there to Keith, Blake, Ben. You know, we want you guys to, to come back, do it again. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a whole whole another big set of questions available to you. But again, we want to thank you guys for your time uh, today and, and answering everyone's questions. And guys, to the audience uh, out there on Zoom and Instagram and Facebook and uh, YouTube, thanks for tuning in today and, uh, and being part of this and, and participating. Can I have a par parting word real quick? before Absolutely. everybody signs off. Absolutely. So if you're even remotely interested in all this stuff, and if you hung in this long, then you qualify as being remotely you're interested. You're remotely interested. <laughs> yeah. You're in. uh, you should definitely check out uh, EFI University, Ben's Facebook page. Uh, he's got this thing going called Delta Lambda, um, which is essentially, if you like this, you're going to like that. You should definitely <laughs> check it out because what we're really talking about a lot of this is you need to think this thing through before we start buying parts. I mean, Ben and I are working on a project and we had the same conversation this morning. It is so easy to get fixated on cool parts and neat looking things that are shiny and cool and forget about the big picture. You got to start with the big picture and the Delta Lambda group is a way to kind of drill that into your brain. Think big yeah, picture I mean, first, then drill into detail. So I mean, I certainly... I certainly appreciate the plug. The Delta Lambda is a fraternity, right? And so when I looked up the definition of, fr of a fraternity, it was a group of people uh, joined together for a common goal. And in our goal, that was to learn as much as we can about racing engines as part of a community rather than a race team, which is always trying to learn to get an advantage and keep it a secret from everybody else. We wanted to, here at EFI University, we wanted a way to keep learning, but also build the community. And I think the best way to do that is together. And uh, unfortunately, in today's world, it's difficult for people to travel and come here and, and work hand in hand side by side with us. So we came up with a way that we could work together uh, online. So basically we put out lessons, then we have a private group that we can discuss and, and there's no, there's no uh, kingfish, right? Like it's not the, the cult leader guy says and everybody just nods and says, yeah, that's right. It's a place to exchange ideas and information and actually do real world testing and research and development and share it with people. So we called our EFI university, we started a fraternity and we called it the Delta Lambdas. So uh, kind of a fun way to do it. Yeah, no, excellent. Um, 
Ben, like you said, you know, we're, we're all out there on social media. Um, you guys can find a bunch of stuff on Engine Builder, Total Seal, EFI University. Um, so make sure you guys reach out to us on whatever platform you're, you're comfortable using. <laughs> uh, and again, uh, we appreciate the, the three of you guys being here today and, and speaking to the audience. It's a privilege. Thanks for letting us. Appreciate being here. All right, guys. Well, thanks again for watching and I uh, hope you guys will join us next time. Okay. Have a good one.